everybody and welcome to my new SQL Server Quickie. Man, it's a long time ago since I had my last Quickie back in December where my good old friend Santa Claus talked about bookmark lookups within SQL Server. But the last months were really stressful for me and very very busy. I had a lot of great consulting engagements around Europe and I have flown more air miles than ever across the good old Europe. So in this SQL Server Quickie, I'm talking today about thread pool starvation within SQL Server. As you might know, every query within SQL Server needs at least one worker thread for query execution. Imagine what happens when all worker threads are just exhausted. In this case, your red phone should ring because you are not able to connect to SQL Server anymore. Sounds interesting and thrilling for you? So come on and join me on the flip chart to lay out the foundation about that specific problem and then I will show you in a demo how you can get into thread pool starvation and how you can recover it with a backdoor from SQL Server. One of the first things that happen within SQL Server when you are starting a new query is the assignment of a worker thread. SQL Server itself has internally a pool of worker threads and their size can be configured through the max worker threads option. By default, that option is zero, which means SQL Server itself decides based on the processor architecture x32, x64 and the number of cores that we have assigned to SQL Server, how many worker threads we have available. In my scenario, I'm running SQL Server on an x64 VM with four assigned cores, which means I have 512 worker threads available. As soon as the query itself is finished, the assigned worker thread goes back to the worker pool and another query can pick up that worker thread and can reuse it for its operation. Sounds very straightforward and easy. But you have to be aware of the fact that the worker thread is still bound to a query as soon as that specific query goes into the suspended state. For example, when we are waiting on resources like a log that we want to acquire or when we are reading pages from our storage into the buffer pool. The fact is, as I've said, those worker threads are still bound to that query, which means when we are running a lot of different queries which are going into the suspended state, that worker thread pool is just exhausted and SQL Server can't accept any incoming connections anymore. That problem is called thread pool starvation within SQL Server. In the next demo, we are trying to recreate that specific problem. What we are doing is the following. We are creating a new table within a SQL Server database and we are beginning a new transaction. Inside that transaction, we begin, we acquire a new exclusive log on that table and we are not committing that transaction anymore. In the next step, we are creating a simple stored procedure and within that stored procedure, we are doing a simple select statement against that table. As you might know, when we are doing a select statement, by default, SQL Server acquires a shared lock. As you can see, exclusive lock and shared locks are not compatible to each other, which means that start procedure with the select statement itself will just block. So we have to wait on that shared lock. It's a traditional locking and blocking scenario within SQL Server. Nothing special about that. But what we are doing is the following. We are running that start procedure 600 times, which means we have here up to 600 sessions which are waiting for that shared lock. As you can imagine, 600 sessions with 512 worker threads, this doesn't really work. So in our case, I want 500 queries will end at the suspended state. They are waiting on a lock mode intent shared on the table level itself, lock mode intent shared, and all the others 
are just waiting on their worker threads. They are producing a weight type of resource, sorry, a weight type of thread pool. So let's go now to SQL Server Management Studio and let's try to reproduce that specific scenario. In the first step of this demo, we are creating a new database. Within that database, we are creating the table that I have described earlier, which will get afterwards exclusively locked. We also insert one record so that we can afterwards retrieve some data. The next step, we are creating the stored procedure named read workload that we will run afterwards with 600 parallel users. As you can see from the definition of that stored procedure, it's very simple. We are just selecting all the records, which also means SQL Server has to acquire a shared log when we are reading from that table. As you can also see from the option max worker threads, I'm running here with the, with the default setting of zero, which means SQL Server itself decides based on the formula from earlier how many worker threads I have available. When we look into system or sysinfo, we can see from the column max worker count how many threads we have available. In my scenario, the 512 that I have mentioned earlier. The next step, we are beginning here a new transaction and acquiring an exclusive log on that table without ever committing that transaction. This means now, when we are running our stored procedure with the simple select statement, that stored procedure just blocked. Just blocks. Nothing special about that. That's a traditional locking blocking scenario within SQL Server. But what happens now when we are running that stored procedure with 600 parallel users? I'm using here the tool ostress.exe, which is part of the RML utilities that you can download from Microsoft completely free. As you can see from the highlighted comment, we are executing that stored procedure now with 600 parallel users. So let's copy that comment over to the comment prompt and just run it. It takes now some time until these users are connected to SQL Server. As you can already see from the comment prompt, we are getting now some error messages regarding connection timeouts. So let's go now back to SQL Server Management Studio and let's try to open a new connection. Boom! We are not able to connect to SQL Server anymore. Makes sense. We have no worker threads. So the question is now, how we can troubleshoot that problem? Normally, people are just restarting SQL Server in, this, in that case. But that's not really my preferred option. Restarting SQL Server is always a bad idea. Since SQL Server 2005, Microsoft offers us the so-called dedicated admin connection, DAC. With the DAC, we can even connect to SQL Server when we have no worker threads anymore. It's just a backdoor into SQL Server. To use the DAC, you just specify admin column server name as your server name when you connect to SQL Server. And as you can see now, we are back to SQL Server land. So, when, so now we can troubleshoot the problem itself. In the first step, we can look into system exec requests and see why queries are currently waiting within SQL Server. As you can see from the column wait type, we have a lot of queries which are waiting for the wait type lock mode indent shared. Makes sense, because when we want to read from that table, SQL Server requires in the first step an indent shared lock on the table itself. But the table is already blocked through our ongoing transaction with an exclusive lock, which means that query just blocks. The interesting thing from the output is now that we are not seeing all our 600 connections here. As you can see here, I'm seeing a little bit more than 500 requests, so a few requests, a few queries are just missing here. Of course, they are missing here in system exec requests because they are waiting outside the execution engine for a worker thread. You can see only queries within system exec requests which have already an assigned worker thread and which are already executing within SQL Server. So to, so to, to find all the other queries, we have to go to system always waiting tasks. Here we can see now a lot of different queries which are waiting for thread pool. They are waiting for the assignment of a worker thread so that they can execute. As you can also see, they have no session ID. 
they are not really executing by now inside SQL Server. So that's our threat pool starvation scenario. When we look again in system exec requests, you can also see in the column blocking session ID who is blocking a specific query. In our case, this is the session ID 64 and session ID 64 is blocked by 51. So 51 is our so-called head blocker. So we can further troubleshoot that information from system exec sessions. As you can see, session ID 51 is a query from SQL Server Management Studio. And oops. That query was submitted by me. So we can go now to system exit connections and analyze the connection itself. The most important column here, from my perspective, is the most recent SQL handle. That column tells us what was the last SQL Server statement that that specific connection was executing. So we grab that SQL handle and passing in to the dynamic management function system exit SQL text to retrieve that specific statement. And as you can see, that's our statement, where we have started a new transaction without ever committing it. So let's just kill that head blocker. This will resolve now our blocking scenario within SQL Server, which means our waiting queries will continue and finally finish. They will return back the worker thread to the thread pool, which means the other requests which are currently waiting for the wait that thread pool can also continue. So as you can see, we are now able to connect to SQL Server again and our workload has also finished in the meantime. The only thing that you don't have to forget is to close the dedicated admin connection because you have only one for your whole SQL Server instance. So please be very, very careful about it. As you have seen in the SQL Server quickie, running out of worker threads and reproducing thread pool starvation within SQL Server is very easy. What are the lessons learned from this SQL Server Quickie? First thing, of course, is that you should keep your transactions as short as possible. As you have seen, when you have long-running transactions, those transactions are always holding logs within SQL Server when you are changing data, which means you can get into thread pool starvation when you have other queries which are competing against incompatible logs. And the second thing that we have seen was that you do not need to restart SQL Server when SQL Server is unresponsive. Since SQL Server 2005, you have the dedicated admin connection, which is a backdoor into SQL Server. The only thing that you have to be aware of is the fact that you have only one dedicated admin connection, so when you don't use it anymore, you have to close it. I hope you have enjoyed the SQL Server wiki, and I'm looking forward to see you in the next one. Man, I'm really happy I'm finished with that SQL Server quickie. It's so hot here in Vienna, we have 30 centigrees. So I'm really, really happy I'm finished. But I know what I'm doing now. Going to untrust me, as you can see, and then I'm going to swimming. See you.